Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. There may be times in your Bible study when you think you're walking on the moon, but just a little bit of explanation, you'll find out, no, I'm actually walking on solid ground. Ezekiel 37 is one of those passages where just a couple words of explanation suddenly just opens up a whole realm of exciting truth. And so I'm Russ Brewer, and you are listening to our study in the key chapters of God's Word, and today we are going to look at Ezekiel 37. Now, I should mention that if you're listening as a family, maybe parents want to just make sure this podcast is okay for younger listeners. There's a couple of details coming on up pretty quickly that might be kind of scary for some of the younger kiddos in our audience. So let's dive into Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 builds on what began yesterday in Ezekiel 36. Yesterday, we unpacked Ezekiel 36, and we saw the kind of spiritual work the Lord does when he brings about the new covenant, and he places his spirit within his people. He gives them a new heart that is careful to obey his commands. He saves them from their sins, and he establishes them as his people. And so Ezekiel 36 tells us so many riches of the new covenant, but we might be tempted to ask, well, well, how will that message get out? How will people find out about this? And that's a good question, and that's answered in chapter 37. The first verse of chapter 37 doesn't give us any separation between 36 and 37, and so Ezekiel wants us just to kind of keep these two ideas together, that the work of the Spirit in chapter 36 is going to be through the work of the Word in chapter 37. So let's dive into Ezekiel 37. Uh, Verse 1 lets us know that the Lord is giving Ezekiel a vision of a valley that is full of bones. Then in verse 2, he lets us know that these were dry bones. These are old bones. These are very dry bones. And so just pause for a moment and just picture this valley filled with sun-bleached piles of human bones with no skin or sinew on them or anything else. This is pretty gross stuff. And then the Lord asks Ezekiel about the impossible in verse 3. He says, Son of man, can these bones live? Now the obvious answer would be, no, of course not. These are old, dry bones. Uh, Whatever life was in them is long gone. But the Lord has other thoughts. And so in verse 4, he tells Ezekiel to prophesy over the bones. Now, remember, often that term prophesy in the Bible speaks to proclaiming the message of God. It's not necessarily just speaking of predicting future events, but just declare God's message. And so the act of this prophecy is how the Lord is going to be bringing about this new life that we're going to be seeing here in this passage. And so the Lord has Ezekiel prophesy to the bones of verse 5, and he says, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. Verse 6, I will put sinews on you and make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you so that you may come alive. And so Ezekiel's talking to a bunch of dry bones and giving them this message of life and restoration and even a spiritual and national resurrection. And so Ezekiel's pretty much okay with this whole preach to the pile of bones thing, but he wasn't expecting what happens in verse 7. In verse 7, Ezekiel hears a noise, a a rattling. Like, this is like some kind of eerie little moment where there's a pile of bones all around him and suddenly things start making creepy, rattly sounds. And then the bones start coming together. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's pretty pretty scary. These bones are coming together. And in verse 8, sinews come on them and skin returns. And and you think that's enough, but it's not. And the end of verse 8 says, but there was no breath in them. And so these bones had now flesh and, and all that. But nothing, they weren't alive. They were still dead. And so (laughs) you got this situation. And the Lord says to him in verse 9, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may come to life. And so Ezekiel does this. And in verse 10, these bones, this flesh, this bodies, they all stand on up and they get to their feet. And there's just this exceedingly great army. And so this is an amazing vision. Just pausing for a moment here. Uh, You have these dead bones restored to a state of flesh and sinew, but still no life. It takes God again to work to produce life within them. And all of this was done by the proclamation of the Word of God. I mean, this is scary, yeah, but it's also powerful. And then the Lord explains to Ezekiel the meaning of the vision. He says in verse 11, These bones are the whole house of Israel. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast for the last several months, then you know that after the reign of Solomon, Israel was divided into a northern and southern kingdom. But here we see that in the plan of God, they'll be restored as one nation. And though they were cut off, God has a plan for them. 
And so in verses 12 and 13, God will cause them to come out of the grave and return to the land of Israel. In verse 14, God will place his spirit within them and give them life. This is just such an astounding message of hope. This resurrection of life that we're seeing here in chapter 37 comes about by the Holy Spirit through the proclamation of the word of God. And so this is some great stuff. But God's illustrations are not finished in Ezekiel 37. And so verse 15 starts a new illustration that brings further clarity to this continuing promise to God's people. And so as we continue on in this chapter, the Lord tells Ezekiel now to take two sticks and write on one stick the name Judah and write on the other stick the name Ephraim and join them together and proclaim to the people down in verse 22, I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel and one king will be king for all of them. And they will no longer be two nations and no longer be divided into two kingdoms. And so now we're seeing that this army of restored people will comprise all of the children of Israel. And not only that, they will be ruled by the Messiah King. Verse 24 goes on to say, My servant David will be king over them and they will all have one shepherd and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. And so now this prophecy that we're reading here in Ezekiel 37 dovetails perfectly with what we've been learning about from Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 about the new covenant. God will give his people a new spirit and a new heart. He will place his spirit within them. He will write his law in their heart and he will give them his servant as their Messiah King. And then at the end of verse 24, they will walk in his ordinances and keep his statutes and observe him. And so these people of of all the people in this world, These people will be the ones who walk according to God's principles and obey him. Now, let's look at how he characterizes this whole promise in verse 26. He says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. Notice that verse 26 says this is an everlasting covenant. Now, in a way, this is not a new idea. I mean, after all, the Abrahamic covenant was called an everlasting covenant, Genesis 17, 7. The covenant of the Mosaic law was called an everlasting covenant in Leviticus 24, 8. And the Davidic covenant was called an everlasting covenant in 2 Samuel 23, 5. But now we see that these covenants are kind of like rivers that merge together and become this one new covenant here, this everlasting covenant that pulls together all of God's promises for the land, the people, for their own righteousness, and for this eternal Davidic king. And so this new relationship with this unified nation of Israel is one of this new covenant. It's a covenant of peace where God's people will have peaceful harmony with him and with one another. And so in verse 27, he says, my dwelling place also will be with them and I will be their God and they will be my people. And finally, in verse 28, this is so that the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. So that's Ezekiel 37. Now pulling this chapter together, through the prophet Ezekiel, God is telling his people that he still has a future plan for them. He has not done with them. He will take them from the nations and restore them to their land. And when he restores them, they will be one people, one nation under God. This work will be accomplished by the faithful proclamation of the word of God. And when this message is proclaimed, God will be producing life in his people. They will be his people and he will be their God and his servant David will rule over them as a shepherd. They will walk in his ways. They will keep his statutes and God will dwell in their midst and they will worship him forever. In so many ways, uh, this sums up the entire message of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. We don't have time to look at the book of Revelation, but we see all of these promises coming together in the last couple of chapters of the Bible where God makes all things new and establishes his kingdom of righteousness. And so this chapter here just amazingly looks to the beginning of time and to the end of time in just a few verses. So much more could be said, but let's just end there and just kind of wrap up with some final thoughts of application. So how do we apply this passage to our life? Well, for one thing, this chapter starts out showing us how the work of God is going to be accomplished. It's going to come about through the faithful proclamation of the Word of God. There is spiritual power in the Word of God. If you have a moment, turn in your Bibles over to 1 Peter 1.23. I'll just read it to you if you don't have time. 1 Peter 1.23 says, For you have been born again, not as seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring Word of God. And that's a similar idea as James 1.18, which also says, In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. 
You see, these New Testament authors recognize that anyone who would accept this new covenant did so by the power of the word of God. When God brings new life into a person, it is by his word and through his word. In other words, it is by his commandment and through the proclamation of his truth that the Holy Spirit creates life in the hearer. And when God creates life within us, we're going to hear the message, we're going to believe it, we're going to respond appropriately and embrace Jesus Christ as our covenant king. And now try for a moment to just imagine how Ezekiel would have been doing this with this valley of this dry bones here. God wanted him to prophesy over what seemed to just be this pile of dead bones. But what appears to be dead to us may be something or someone that God has a plan for. And so Ezekiel was faithful to speak God's word to what seemed to be dead. And and like him, our job is to be faithful as well and to proclaim the word of God clearly and accurately and with conviction, no matter how responsive or unresponsive our hearers are. Our success as God's servants is not based on the response of the people, but our faithfulness to the Word of God. We may think that the world needs a new, cool, updated explanation of the gospel, but here we're seeing that when we talk with people, if they reject our message, we may feel like we have failed, but the fact is we can only fail if we're not being faithful to the Word of God. The Word of God is how He creates life. The Word of God is the powerful message. It is the message that He has given to us to bring life to the world around us. And so our message must center on this idea of inviting people into covenant with God where we might join together with his people and wait for his return when he establishes his kingdom. Now, another point of application here is one that we've made several times. Here we're seeing that being one of God's people means obeying what he says, Uh, not just simply being moral by the world standards, but actually knowing what his covenant documents say and living by the principles he has given to us by living out what it means to be members of his kingdom, citizens of his kingdom. When we are in covenant with him, we will be living by his word and we will be serving him as our king. We'll be walking with him. We'll be abiding in fellowship with him. We'll be proclaiming the the message of his kingdom to those around us. Finally, this passage pulls together really the entire message of scripture. This passage here, Ezekiel 37, is teaching us how God's plan is just continuing to unfold in our world around us. And as we look at this passage, we can look forward to the book of Revelation and see how the Lord ties all these principles together in the end of times, which we'll be learning about tomorrow in Ezekiel 38. So we have so much to look forward to. We have so much to praise God for. So let's end our time here in Ezekiel 37 by asking him just to strengthen our faith in his promises and guide us how to walk according to them that we might bring him glory and bring his message to the world around us. We'll leave things there. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.